that Jamaluddin is one of them. Um, uh, I forgot his full name, but Jamaluddin is a very good photographer. What he does, and he's given lectures, uh, maybe Rakan Chiel can invite Jamaluddin one day. Yes, very good. Uh, Rabbi Jamaluddin. Rabbi Jamaluddin. Rabbi Jamaluddin. Yeah. My goodness. <laughs> how uh, both insensitive of me. Rabbi Jamaluddin. So he's excellent. He, he takes photos of the current and then uh, the previous look from all photographs available. Okay, so the important thing is just to, to show. So you know this is the uh, HSBC building. Okay, and uh, now this one. So you see, uh, as per the uh, original impression, and then uh, at one point in 2009, until let's say two years ago, you actually had this. Okay, this one was no longer yeah. seen, but actually it's there, it's hidden underneath uh, that. So when they finally uh, okay, and then they found this and they uh, uh, uncovered it back. Okay, so it's there. If you go there today, you'll see more of it. But um, now let's go to the final image. Okay, this is what you see there today. Okay. Uh, in a way, it's, I'm both happy and sad. Happy that uh, at the moment it does look nice, you know, and especially at night, you know, there's the dancing after the uh, after the last prayer. There's the music that comes on as well. You know, lights and everything, and all the mist that comes out. It, it becomes mystical, but uh, uh, not M Y S S M I S mystical because all this mist comes out. It's quite <laughs> And uh, so those are the steps. They are all there now. Uh, not not rebuilt. I mean, the original one is just repaired, and you have the fountain. So uh, previous to the River of Life project, you couldn't see this. Because these trees were so wrinkled, they were so full, so they have cut down many of the branches, so you can now see the Ramana Sultana uh, Dosaman, the other side, um, <coughs> and, uh, and, and enjoy that. Uh, so, okay, this is a photo of before this, when it was, when the trees were there. So you can actually bring a book, you know, bring your little. Uh, to yeah, mat, mat guitar, and uh, just sit there and, and read. Okay, you can do that now, but then you get wet. <laughs> okay, yes. uh, because the fountain apparently goes on and off whenever it pleases. I couldn't detect the uh, timing. Yeah, uh, because I go there all the time, bringing tourists, bringing uh, visitors like my uh, colleagues uh, do as well. So even even when we are there, it's not it's not. They know the fountain is not working, away. and then suddenly it comes out, and then everybody has to rush <laughs> away from the, 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 the uh, you know, all the, the spray and the mist and everything. And and uh, look at yes, this is the lower one, and the higher one. Okay, mm -hmm. the high. So if it suddenly comes on, and then the wind is blowing this way, you will get soaking wet. Mm -hmm. okay. So do be a bit careful uh, on that. Yeah. Okay, I think that's the last. Yes. So I just made a little, uh, instead of just very much happy, very much happy. Okay. Thank you. See, I, I'm not a know-it-all. I don't know everything. But uh, uh, if you have any questions, I'll try my best uh, to answer. Yeah. yeah I, maybe I, I give the mic back first to this one to moderate. I don't know. <laughs> Thank you so much, Nash. Yeah. Will they use this chat or will they use uh, pen? Okay, alright. Um, I don't want to spend too much time, but I do have a few questions. Um, well, you come up with a topic, a question that we look at, a rest of the summit and uh, the other way. Um, would you be able to uh, explain a bit to us the reason why you came up with a question that we look for us, especially for myself, we have also with a lot of intent. The word falsification is not an attribute of a human feeling to a building. So, how does one go about uh, being passionate about building uh, to a point where we really go to really appreciate the building like what you just discussed? Uh, cause it can be quite overwhelming okay. for a person who may not be aware of it. Okay, thank you uh, for the question. Um, actually, uh, I know you guys are passionate about these things because you are here. Okay. 
and that's good. I really, really appreciate that. The, the sad thing is that not many Malaysians are like us. Not many. And instead, if you go to Western countries or developed countries, Japan included, okay, if you had a lecture like this, my goodness, it would like be full, full. I have given uh, lectures like this in uh, uh, in Rome, uh, in uh, uh, Tokyo, and it's just overwhelming. There's standing room, and they don't mind. You know, if they come late, there's no more space to sit. They stand. Okay, because I've been standing here for two hours, and um, you know, they, they they don't think anything about it because their mentality is different. Their mentality is they appreciate knowledge, mm -hmm. they appreciate heritage, they appreciate history, regardless of whose it is. I talk obviously about Malaysian heritage or Southeast Asian heritage, and they came. Okay, I give you another example, and I'll, I'll relate back to this. Um, you know the Perak man, okay, the Perak man, the skeleton of now that is something so fantastic. It is the oldest complete human skeleton found in Southeast Asia. Eleven thousand years old. A complete human skeleton. Okay? Now um, when the the skeleton was brought to Japan for an exhibition, the Japanese came in droves. They were waiting at the, the museum door to come in to see this skeleton. And they're not even Southeast Asian. And then when it was brought back and, and uh, put at Museum Negara, <laughs> Malaysian okay, star, you know. I don't know what, I don't I, you know, that's the difference between a developed mentality, a developed nation's mentality, and a developing country's mentality. To be truth be told, we're not the only ones. I mean, it's a, similar uh, in other developing countries, so we, we shouldn't kick ourselves, but we should start changing. We should start changing. And one of the ways that we should start changing is by getting our kids to be interested, which is why I have my daughter here. But I want her and her siblings to be interested in that, because this is our heritage. Okay? Now, the thing is, that, that, that passion comes in is, when you have knowledge. Knowledge breeds understanding. And when you have understanding, you have tolerance. And we have, when you have tolerance, you have peace. So it all begins with knowledge. Okay? If, uh, if you didn't know why something happens in a Hindu temple, or in a Chinese temple, or in a mosque, or in a church, you, know, you begin to have your own preconceived prejudiced ideas about the teachings of that religion. But if you start to learn about the other religions, what uh, you know, all the good things that each religion has, then you begin to understand that yes, you know, we, there's so much that we need to understand of each other. Okay. So, my daughter speaks fluent Mandarin. She writes Mandarin. She's a translator. Um, she does, actually does um, sorry calligraphy, Chinese calligraphy, because I want my kids to you know. At, uh, I even wanted my younger son to be sent to a Tamil school, uh, but it was too far because there are not that many Tamil schools, so we have to send to Chinese uh, school as well. But um, that's what we have to do. We have to, and uh, and even then, in Malaysia, we are not so bad actually. We're okay. okay we, don't, we we are we have been living together as various different races for so long. Um, it's very rare that we have. Even adik beradik pun bergaduhkan. So, what more if you have different uh, uh, races and uh, communities and religions? But uh, we have to actively understand that. If not, we might go downhill. So, uh, that's where the passion comes in, in which buildings are a part of that. You have, uh, beside these buildings, you have mosques, you have churches, you have temples. Hindu temples, um, Taoist temples, Buddhist temples, each one with its own distinct architecture. So we need to know that architecture, we need to know why the buildings were built that way, we need to also uh, understand, like for example, in, in Islam, okay, a building doesn't have to look like that to be a mosque. So many, almost each state in Malaysia has 
a mosque that looks like a Chinese temple. Every there's one in Perak, there's one in Malacca, there's two in Kelantan. Okay, they are mosques, but they look like Chinese temples, and it shows that Muslims do. You know, they have no qualms about it. They hold church that has been sold to the Muslim community and turned into a mosque. The only stipulation is that the exterior has to continue looking like a church. And it's fine. The Muslims go there for their prayers. You know, it's not. It's not something that uh, is so anathema, is so unacceptable because we have that knowledge. So that's. I hope that answers the question. Okay, hey, any others? Yes. Just a simple question. <coughs> um, you would like to check have the mic again. Yeah. Um, why were where were the bricks sourced for the ah, okay. of the summer and why is okay. it yellow? Okay, very good, very good question. Actually, I should have mentioned that in uh, my at that time it just changed my mind. Okay, can we go back to uh okay. uh Abu Masulana Abdul Samad? was the padang butter that was created to supply bricks to Kuala Lumpur. Now, before that, uh, the archives indicate that uh, before the brick kilns, kilns, brick kilns were opened, uh, we were sourcing for bricks from the uh, recent Milan and uh, for some of the uh, two different types, because bricks come in many types actually, yeah, depends on the clay of the area, depends on the quality of the clay, depends on the quality of the, the brick kiln itself. So um, uh, the furthest uh, was sourced from even from Joho and Singapore. So uh, quite rightly, uh, Sir Frank Swettenham and the other uh, resident generals thought that we must have our own. So one of the reasons brick fields was found uh, to be good was because uh, at the time that it was identified, it was actually swamp. So there were no uh, permanent buildings there. There were a few kampongs. It was uh, on the record there were a few kampongs on stilts. So uh, they didn't mind the swamp. Uh, but apparently, when they drained the swamp, the clay that was found there was good quality. So those were the uh, uh, the clays that were used to. Uh, supply to the buildings around Dataran Merdeka. Okay, now um, again, the the firing of clay, different kills, <coughs> result in different colors. Okay, so if you when you go there, have a look at the color of the Sultan Abdul Samad's brick and the color of this building's brick, okay, and the color of this connection brick. They are all different colors. Go there. Okay, have a look. Now, this one is uh, an older star. It's yellow. So when you go there, it looks very light colored. It's yellow colored. Yes, this is the earlier one. Okay, and then uh, uh, this one from 1910. This is, this is 1897 completed. This is 1910 completed. This one is darker. Okay, darker because the kiln uh, technology had improved and. Uh, Yeah. 
I think so. What happened was, um, uh, it has checking, but it's 1887. Um, at the beginning of the year, there was, uh, goodness, was it beginning with a flood or ending with a flood? Which was which came <laughs> first? Mm. There was a flood in the fire in that same year. And the, uh, many of the buildings at that time were built in timber, because that was the easiest material to find at that time. And uh, so after the, the twin devastations, uh, Sir Frank Swettenham uh, made a, a rule that all new buildings in the city centre area, which is prone to floods, must be built in brick. So that's where uh, the brick kilns were, were begun. Uh, it took some time to drain the swamp and then to have the investments come in. Um, I don't know whether I should mention this on camera, but I guess it's already part of history. <laughs> but, <laughs> so even if I mention it, it's, it's already there in the books. But hmm, apparently, his wife owned one of the brick kilns. <laughs> so a bit of a conflict of interest uh, there. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. So yeah, any other questions? Uh, okay, I saw your hand first, and then, then yours. Yeah. yeah. Um, we had a slide on um, um, yeah. the uh, of Maki Chamek. Yes. Um, and you said that preceded the yeah, um design. Oh, no, 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 no. Uh, I must clarify. Okay. Uh, the drawing or the painting was done before the building was, was constructed, mm -hmm. but the design was already done by Arthur Benson Hubbard. Ah, okay. Okay. Well, that oh, okay. Yeah. So sorry, yeah. then uh, it wasn't yeah, clear I, enough. I wanted to ask that you would call yeah. for an artist to come up with designs so before uh, the architect was okay. in class. Oh, no, then not common at all. Yeah. Exactly. So you're right. Yeah. Sorry, I didn't make that clearer. Uh, let's give the gentleman uh, that. The name of the building yeah. is called Barona Sota Abdul Samad. I think it's of you. Or a building is really. The, the name of the building, it is called uh, Banguna Sota Abdul Samad when the time it was built or the name come after mm. the, the okay. Rebecca of Good Samad. question. Okay. Yeah. okay. Uh, as best as I could tell, and even this also I'm not 100% sure, but uh, at least in one of the books that I have read, yes, uh, the building was completed at the same year that was the last year of Sultan Abdul Samad's reign. Okay, uh, Sultan Abdul Samad died uh, in 1898. So 1897, uh, the building was completed, uh, and then uh, uh, so be apparently before Sultan Abdul Samad passed away, the building was named after him. Okay, but for practical purposes, for practical purposes, the British still just. On an everyday basis, they just call it the Secretariat on a, on a daily basis. But the the the, uh, the name of the building apparently was given uh, Sumpana Sultan Abdul Samad. Okay, I hope that answers your question. Yeah. Okay. Ah, you brought up something uh, which um, I had actually mentioned in the uh, in the synopsis. I was surprised that uh, Masjid Jami was recently re. Not renamed. Uh, most recently, ex the name was extended to Masjid Jami Sultan Abdul Samad, which I think is a bit odd, because Masjid Jami was uh, uh, was uh, begun wow, like ten years after Sultan mm -hmm. Abdul Samad had passed away, and it was uh, during the reign of his grandson Sultan Alaidin Sulaiman Shah, sometimes just called Sultan Sulaiman, and. Uh, I would think that if anything, the name would be Masjid Jamek Sultan Sulaiman or Sultan Alaidin Sulaiman because he was the one who officiated the uh, laying of the foundation stone, everything. Everything is associated with him. He was also the one who helped to raise the money um, in addition to uh, other contributions. So um, I, I don't know, um, and I couldn't get any official explanation. Uh, all that I got was that, oh, yeah, the name has been. You know, it has been extended. I mean, Masjid Jami, the name is still there, but previously it's Masjid Jami Kuala Lumpur. So now it's Masjid Jami Sultan Abdul Samad Kuala Lumpur. They still need that Kuala Lumpur because there is another Masjid Sultan Abdul Samad. Uh, yeah, you, you know, right, in uh, uh, Klang, 
Klang mm. or, or Banting, something like that. I've never been there, but uh, I heard that there's another. Banting. Oh, uh, thank you. Mm-hmm. Uh, Masjid Sultan, Masjid Jami Sultan Abdul Samad, or at least Masjid Sultan Abdul Samad, so it might cause confusion. So I still advocate for it to be, uh, if they want to, you know, <laughs> to use a Sultan's name, then use the name of Sultan uh, Sulaiman or Sultan Alaidim Sulaiman. Yeah. So I hope that answers your question overall. Yeah. Managed by the Kampung Rawa people. Yes. Has it any relations with the Kampung uh, Fire people, the Kampung Baru? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay, good question. Okay, um, the uh, Java Street Mosque in English, or Masjid Jalan Jawa. Um, funnily enough, the people there were not Javanese. Uh, the, uh, the only the name of the road is uh, Javanese. More, uh, I think. Maganti, you will have a better uh, information on the naming then. So we're not going to the naming. Um, but to answer your question, um, as far as I know, no, there is no relation to the Kampung Fire of Kampung Baru. Okay, there's no, no direct relation. Yeah. But that's a good uh, little point you brought up because not many people know that uh, Kampung Baru, okay, although it is a big Kampung, but uh, it is actually made up of seven smaller component kampongs in Kampung Baru and one of them is Kampung Paya. Okay, so that's uh, an interesting thing to, to note here. Yeah. Um, okay. I hope that answers your question, so there's no relation, at least not not in a formal way. Uh, I guess the only relation is the, the name because Rawa and Paya happen to be synonyms, that's all. Yeah. Yes sir? Kampung Jawa is dominated by Javanese. Kampung Paya. Uh, Kampung Paya. Uh, oh, okay. Are you from Kampung Baru? I used to stay there. Ah, okay. Yes. Kampung Paya in Kampung Baru. Yeah. Lot of Javanese. Melaka. Melaka. Kampung Pinang. Ah, Kampung Pinang by Melaka. Yes. Yes. Oh, interestingly enough, uh, Kampung Rawa, okay, that's where the Java Street Mosque was located, uh, it was actually a twin Kampung. There were two Kampungs in one area, both were small Kampungs. The other one, the official name of that has written in the British maps. Uh, so Kampung Paya was the one where the Java Street Mosque was. And then beside that was actually Kampung Melaka. Now that's why you have Jalan Melaka. See, Jalan Melaka is where the Bank Mu'amalat is. So that's Jalan Melaka. So that's where Kampung Melaka was. Yeah? So Magaji, you have yeah, this all. <laughs> Uh, uh, Masjid Jalan Jawa, right? Yes. In one article, I saw it. Uh, um, Masjid Kampung Rama. Yes. Oh, yes. oh, Masjid Kampung Rama. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yes. Okay. Thank you very much. Actually, both are right. Now that you mention it, yes. Um, there are documents that say, and thank you very much, uh, Masjid Kampung Rama. Yes, correct. Uh, there are also documents that mention Masjid. Oh, the thing is, it mentions it, mentions it in English. Java Street Mosque. At least I didn't find any that mentioned Masjid Jalan Jawa. There's just a simple translation. But uh, the one that uh, we have seen is uh, Java Street Mosque. Also Masjid Kampung Rawa. So yeah, both. It's quite common for places to have uh, at least, uh, uh, or sometimes having two names. Yes. International standards, we are pathetic. <laughs> yeah. By international standards, yeah. Now, uh, now again, let me be fair. Those in Jabatan Warisan Negara, okay, they are very passionate. They are very passionate about conserving, about trying to maintain, trying to. Really, but um, if uh, other parts of the machinery don't share that same sentiment, it's difficult. They can't do much. Okay. Now. 
Uh, going back to, I think it's a very good point you brought because I want to go back to that article that I remember I showed you the screenshot. Now, um, the Bangunan uh, uh, Sultan Abdul Samad itself has already undergone phase one of the conservation. So now, generally, it's in good condition. In generally, uh, but there is a phase two of the uh, budget that was already done for the uh, further conservation works of the complex. So when I say the complex, remember I mentioned um, it's um, Bangunan Sultan Abdul Samad proper itself is Complex A or Bangunan A, and then the general post office is B. The other three on the other side are C, D, and E. Okay, so um, there is a phase two of that, which is allocated or budgeted 250 million ringgit, which has not yet been tendered. Okay, so it is budgeted already in the national budget. Okay. Um, and uh, that is for the total refurbishment for the, uh, especially the other three buildings with a little bit more on Bangunan Sultan Abdul Samad itself. Okay, so I think that's good. Okay, so I was very sad when that was one of the items that was cut off from the budget just post election. So um, conservationists are trying to lobby back for that to be uh, put in. Um, the um, uh, the original argument was that oh, 250 million is too much, uh, you know. But that's only the allocation of it. It doesn't mean that all 250 million will be used. But at least you have 250 million for that complex. Because if we want to attract investors, we realize that we have to refurbish it first. If we want the investors to refurbish it on their own money, uh, it's tough. Okay, so we have to refurbish it first uh, to a basic good working level and then investors will come in. So uh, we are lobbying for it back um, and we'll see how it goes. Okay, so, but in general, okay, now, now answering uh, the more general aspects of your question, actually overall our conservation efforts are, are improving, no doubt they are improving. So I do have to give a tabit for that, but not as much as uh, as we see happen in developed countries. Now, for this, I don't blame the government at all. I blame us. Okay, I'll give you an example. Uh, when I was on a working trip in Europe and um, uh, on, on conservation, I was in the Netherlands then, and um, there was word that uh, in Copenhagen, the capital of Denmark, there was a, uh, an old building which was uh, which was badly underutilized. Uh, some parts of it had become a drug den, you know, for you know how drugs are a bit free in parts of Northern Europe. Um, and um, so they were thinking of demolishing it, okay, demolishing it and building something fresh, something new. Now, if that were in Malaysia, everybody would go, well, yeah, you know, everybody would be happy because you have a nice new glittery mall there. But in the in Copenhagen, when that was announced. The people themselves went up in arms and said, no, we don't want that. You clean up the building and you do something good with it, but we want that building there. So it's the people. It's not... The, the government will eventually follow the people, eventually. Okay. If, uh, especially in a democracy uh, like ours, uh, which is a normal <laughs> democracy. So if we are vocal about things that have a good logic to it, then it will, it will happen. So we are the ones who have to uh, advocate for conservation for um, uh, because it's also a dollars and cents thing. Tourists, when they come, they don't want to see another mega mall. No. They want to see those lovely old shop houses. They, and then when they go out, they want to see the kampung houses. They don't want to see a nice big bungalow. I mean, good for you. They will say, yeah, good for you. You have a nice big bungalow, but we have better villas in Italy, in France, you know, modern mansions in the US. Nothing. Ours is nothing. But you show them a lovely old timber kampong house, even if it's half crumbling, they will still oh, take photos. You know, I've seen it with my own eyes because that's something they don't have. As simple as that, even if it's a crumbling old, old house. So, 
that's where conservation comes in. It's also making good, honest money for all of us. It's not just the, the, the heritage, it's not just the posterity, but it's the memory. So this is where I leave you guys with a famous quote, and I, I'm sorry, I always forget the name of the, the man who gave this quote. He's British, <laughs> that's all, that's all I remember. Um, after two, um, a city without old buildings is like a man without a memory. Okay. A city without old buildings is like a man without a memory. He goes around not remembering, you know, he walks around empty, eh, eh. <laughs> uh, like zombie, like that. Now, I have added that, okay, um, after two, uh, a city without, okay, going on, a city without old buildings is like a man without a memory. And also, a city, this is where I add, okay, a city without street life is like a woman without a smile. No, when you have a city, you need to have people walking about, you need to have, you know, uh, of course if it's bad weather, it's a different thing. Mm -hmm. But, um, and that's something that malls don't do. Malls just you know, put everyone inside. And